average people like you and me that were trying to get get ahead, try to save for their kids' education, try to you know do a home renovation or something like that. And a lot of that is really lost in in this story, right? You know, um, there were some very high end, very wealthy investors. But there were other people that were devastated by this individual. I mean, there are people who had serious psychological issues. These people have been through hell. Yeah. I mean, people lost their life savings. Welcome to After Action, true stories of the diplomatic security service. I'm Chad Hammer. In addition to protecting diplomats and embassies, DSS investigates a wide range of cross-border crimes. With us today is DSS Special Agent Ryan McSiffany, here to tell us about one of his most audacious criminal targets. Lifelong con man, Anthony Gignac, successfully posed as a Saudi prince to bilk millions of dollars from investors large and small. Thanks, Ryan. Welcome. Thank you. So, tell me a little bit about how this was set up when you arrived in Miami. Sure, Hurricane had just come through Miami, pretty much devastated the city. This is in September of 2017. Okay. I had left Anga. To the UN Assembly, which is our- United Nations General Assembly. Another big rite of passage for DS sure domestically. Is. Yeah. Sure is, so Okay. Got to Miami, Hurricane had really devastated the city and uh, got to the field office. I was an acting unit supervisor at the okay. time. And um, first weekend I was driving through Florida trying to uh, because of the flooding and all that, it was a bit difficult. But I got a call from a first tour agent who said he had a lead on someone who might be posing as a diplomat and uh, committed some type of financial crime. Okay, how did this lead come to us? So a uh, private investigator with a, uh, a hotel in Miami okay. um, referred the case to the FBI. It made its way to our JTTF agent, the DS agent on the task force who looked at it, referred it to Miami field office, and then it was given to this new agent to uh, to look into as a lead. Okay, and this new agent had a background that helped him, I think, a little bit with this case. Yes, he was an attorney by trade. Uh, he had previous uh, government experience. Okay, great. So he was very familiar with you know legal process, indictments, affidavits, things like that. So okay. he was a very savvy investigator. So what did he bring you? Um, he brought me some information that this person was, in fact, uh, Anthony Gignac, career con man with a long rap sheet of conning people, Started small with credit card fraud, hotel fraud, things like that, and then it escalated over the years. DS had previously prosecuted this individual in 2003 for a similar type crime. Wow. Um, and now he was out of prison. He did about eight to 10 years on DS and federal charges. And then the Secret Service took a whack at him. Then the locals took a whack at him. But as soon as he got out of prison around 2016, 17, he set his eyes on Miami and went for the biggest scam in history. Wow. So what was your next steps? So I told the agent, and again, I didn't know him very well, um, but I said, you know, forego the training that we was a requirement the following week. We mm. were doing a uh, range day and then some other type, you know, agent training. Um, because he was also new to the office. No, I think he'd been there for about six or eight months, but okay. we were doing sustainability skills training, things like that, driving, shooting. Routine training. Physical yeah. training, things okay. like that. I said, just make sure you have something to show for it, you know. Um, I said, all right, I will. So get through the week and he came to me and he said, look, we have a meeting with the AUSA who's going to accept the case for prosecution. Okay. He said, let me review it before we, we go over there, you know, just standard DS procedures. And the case was airtight. Um, he had run all the checks in the consular consolidated database. He had, you know, photographs, fingerprints, and all the facts were straight and went and met with the AUSA. It was a very, uh, very phenomenal uh, attorney. Okay. Long track record in Miami, long track record in private practice as well. Um, so now we know who this guy is. Now we know we're going to swear out, you know, complaint. We're mm -hmm. going to, you know, get this guy on passport fraud and aggravated identity theft because he was traveling on another person's passport. Okay. But how do we find this dude? Okay. So we had passport fraud. There's, there's more than one type of passport fraud, right? Yeah. There's several statutes on the books. Okay. Which all DS agents should know. Right. <laughs> so he was using a phony book or? No, he was using a legitimate passport. So typically what we see in passport fraud cases is someone who makes a false statement in a passport application right. to, to get a book when they're not that individual. That's the most common theme. And when we do have a prosecution for that, the two go hand in hand, a false statement of passport application and an aggravated identity theft, which carries a mandatory two-year prison sentence because of the issues with aggravated identity theft, and it's so rampant. And then you said you had to locate him to affect the we arrest. We did. We did. So we were able to track his movements overseas through physical surveillance, through uh, search, electronic search warrants, subpoenas, and things like that, Great. and also social media. I mean, this guy loved the limelight. He loved the glitz. He loved the glamour. So. 
he left a trail that was uh, you know easy for us to uh, pick up on his on his whereabouts. So what happened next? I'm in my hotel room. Didn't have electricity or running water that day because of the hurricane. A lot of junk and cockroaches around the hotel. I say after a hurricane, if you've never been to South Florida or lived through a hurricane, this is what happens. But, you didn't uh, even have an apartment yet. No, I was living out of my car and out of a hotel. Wow. So we get an idea of where he's going to be. Search warrants in place, arrest warrants in place. Now, how do we want to do this? This guy's savvy. He's had a history of destroying evidence of evading authorities. We needed to make it airtight. So um, we met in the Miami field office, outstanding leadership. Um, Dave Hazarian, who has since retired. Steve Silva was involved. He's since retired as well. Um, but we looked at this and said, all right, we're going to arrest him in New York. We're going to do a simultaneous search warrant in Miami on his residence that was about 4,500 square feet. Okay. Keep in mind, this is Fisher Island, very exclusive place. Uh, a lot of celebrities, a lot of affluent people live there, and it's not open to the public. Outsiders need not apply. And what I mean is you can only get there by ferry or helicopter. Wow. So how do I get about 10 Suburbans and 40 agents over there quietly? Because it's a big place you're about to search. Discreetly, very large place. Mm -hmm. So we had worked the angles with the security folks at, um, at Fisher Island. Mm -hmm. They knew we were coming and all that. So this is on like a Thursday or a Friday and this is moving, right? I mean, this is moving very quickly. Right, because from the time you got the lead to the time you got the warrants was how long? Probably three or four weeks, oh, that's so, somewhere around there. That's yeah, I mean, I got to Miami, case. Ongo's usually mid-September. I got there probably late because I was you know, on a detail that went too long. Um, so we're talking, yeah, October, I think this happened, October, November, somewhere around there. Um, so it's all set. Goal was to meet Sunday morning at, or Sunday afternoon, about 1500. He was going to be wheels down at, I think, 1800. Where was he coming from? He was coming from Hong Kong. Okay. I think it was a direct flight Hong Kong to JFK. So we had everything set. They're going to take him into custody, take the electronics, make sure there's no communication, financial crimes case. You got to worry about evidence destruction, some type of malware or any type of, you know, cyber threat that can delete all this information that could have led to a prosecution. Um, so we're ready to go, right? Trucks ready to, trucks lined up, you know, get to the office at 1500, watch some college football or watch some NFL in the morning, you know, catch a bit of the game. I actually got a workout in and I get back to my hotel room at probably 9.30, flash message from DHS. He's on an earlier flight. He's going to be wheels down at noon. Of course. Of course. Didn't hesitate. Blasted the message out. Report to MFO right now. Called my ASAC at the time, mm -hmm. uh, Dave Hazarian, said, Dave, he's on his way. we got to get to the office. Dave came in. Uh, Fred Stolper, who was the SAC at the time, came in. Um, we sat down and didn't have time for a, a whole lot of discussion and talk. It's the moment of action. And New York was this. ready as well. You had to coordinate with them. New York was ready as well. Two agents were up there from Miami. NIFO helped out a bit. They sent an agent or two, greased the skids with us, for us at, um, at the airport. Sure. With their, with their DHS contacts and all that. So um, yeah, we're tracking the flight real time, working with CBP and things like that. He lands and um, our agents were there waiting for him. Uh, took him into custody, search incident to arrest. He had a lot of valuables on him, cash, jewelry, things like that. After the search incident to arrest, he's standing there in his birthday suit and has something in his hands. And it was money that was wrapped in a condom and was inserted in his rectum for that 14-hour flight. Wow. wow. So I'm glad I didn't have to bag that evidence. Was he traveling alone? No, he was traveling with Carl Williamson, who is now deceased. Killed himself um, as a result of all this. But he was, his, uh, he was a co-conspirator. Um, he died before we could indict him. Uh, but he was traveling with him. So what were the next step in the investigation? It just started, right? Yeah. I mean, like you work a homicide, a lot of times you have a body and you're looking for your person for years. I mean, these things can take 20 or 30 years. Financial crimes, money laundering, things like this. We're able to, you know, get our guy pretty quickly. You found useful stuff at the house too? Absolutely. The search warrant, uh, we got a ton of stuff. Valuables, fake DS badges, fake license plates, um, all types of documents and things like that. A lot of evidentiary value 
And then we encountered one of his bodyguards who was, was very cocky, very arrogant when we encountered him, and he was armed. Um, but very quickly, he realized that it was in his best interest to cooperate and, and give us information. He led us to a, um, a storage unit and another vehicle that had a lot of cash, a lot of valuables and things like that. So we knew at that point that this man was a flight risk and he knew authorities were getting close. The bodyguard told us that he was instructed to start moving things and get storage units. And it actually worked out well because, um, you know, Gignac really used this young man. The storage units were in his name. So that saved us the warrant, saved us, you know, having to go before a judge. And you had was, his consent to search. He consented to search, took us right there, produced a, a lot of valuables, a lot of jewelry and things like that. So you had, the original case was misuse of a passport, impersonation of a diplomat, but you quickly discovered. No, no. First, the arrest warrant was for passport fraud. Mm -hmm and for aggravated identity theft. Right. That okay. was the initial arrest warrant. Okay. Mm -hmm. So after we started looking at the initial tranche of evidence and after, you know, everyone had to go on TDY, everyone had a detail to work on, no one wanted to deal with the evidence and, and you know, the painstaking process of doing this stuff. And hey, that's, that's a criminal investigation. You have to do this and things like that. But, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of agents came forward and, and helped out with this stuff. But um, through that, we were able to determine and, and prosecute on the uh, impersonation of a diplomat charge. And now we have all this electronic evidence. I knew this was a financial crimes case. Where's the money? Okay. And where's the money coming from? Exactly. Exactly. And early on, it was very much like, okay, let's get them again on, you know, eight or 10 years, passport fraud, identity theft. And I'll never forget um, talking with my, my supervisor at the time, Dave Hazari, and he's like, what do you think's going on here? I said, I haven't pinpointed it yet. There's something larger going on here than the Fountain Blue. But I said, my theory is he's luring investors with the Saudi Aramco IPO, which was a legitimate thing at the time. The Saudis were trying to diversify their economy off of oil. They came up with this vision 2030, openness, more transparency, things like that. It was really pushed by Mohammed bin Salman, who's the, the crown prince now. Let's back up a little bit. So Gignac was posing as a Saudi prince. Correct. Right. So that's also kind of where this hinges. So he was using that identity or that status to gain the false faith of investors? That's absolutely right. Okay. And so what kind of projects was he hoping to, to, to use to get money? Anything you can imagine. Anything under the sun that would, would attract people who had money and capital to invest. Pharmaceutical projects, hotels. Um, what else was he involved in? Um, oil and gas ventures, things like that. So he and his conspirator were posing as legitimate businessmen? Correct. How were they doing that? So the, the co-conspirator, Carl Williamson, was an attorney. He did have some experience in that world, but he was the face. He was the recruiter. He was very well spoken. He was polished. He was from the UK, the accent, the whole nine yards. So he would go to people and say he represents a Saudi prince that has interests and would like you to invest with him and he has capital to put up. Um, he went to uh, famous sports figures who, who took the bait, right? Wow. And again, I mean, I remember when I moved to Miami and I was looking at houses, um, my real estate agent at the time told me, she's like, hey, look around here. There's a new Saudi prince in town. He's buying everything up. And I was like, shut my mouth here. <laughs> you know, shut, this was before the uh, this was before the arrest warrant. Wow. Um, but yeah, and he just, you know, looked the part, went to the nice places, went to the Four Seasons, went to the big hotels. But this was also his M.O. If you look at his rap sheet over the years, dating back to the 1980s and 90s, he would stay at hotels, run up bills and then take off. And in Miami-Dade, there's no shortage of scam artists. So Miami-Dade financial crimes, their police won't touch something unless it's under a certain threshold. He knew that threshold. But he knew how to push the limits. But there's always something about hotels with him. So the Fountain Blue was a storied hotel itself. Right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you've ever seen the James Bond series, um, Sean Connery, I think he was the original James Bond. They filmed there in the 50s and 60s. Wow. Elvis Presley, Sammy Davis Jr., they all used to play there, hang out there. A 80s and 90s was a big hub for boxing. Uh, Roberto Duran used to fight there. It was a very, very landmark and historic place in, in, on Miami Beach. So he was using their high profile to kind of garner more investment or somehow linked to that? Yeah, the, the place 
experienced some financial distress. Mm -hmm. um, they were looking for capital, and it was no secret that you know they were they were out trying to recruit investors to buy a a stake in the hotel. And um, you know he showed up and he he looked the part and said he had the money, but at the end of the day they didn't have the money. And we were able to tell through uh, search warrants that you know the the GC of the Fountain Blue um, General Counsel. You saw early on he's like this guy's a scam artist. He's a fraud. Which kind of led to us getting a lead in the first place. Yeah. yeah. If you're gonna if you're gonna buy something, you gotta show proof of funds. You have to show you know this that and the other. But he played them very well. I mean, they took him to Aspen. He picked up the bill. Um, another story that's gone largely unreported is. Um, he kept offering to take people on his private plane and his private yacht. Well, I mean, when it came to do that, he didn't have a plane and he didn't have a yacht. And they did go out on a yacht near Fisher Island at one point. And um, one of the people said, this is a leased yacht. Why is this Saudi prince on a leased yacht? And again, his temper, his behavior, I mean, he is a sociopathic imbecile that doesn't care about anybody or anything. Yeah. He would berate his staff, yell at people, scream at people. And again, I mean, it just wasn't a way to handle yourself around, you know, people that are, you know, trying to invest with you and things like that. Gignek doesn't strike me as a particularly Saudi name. He's not at all even connected to the Saudi nation. No, he's right. born in Colombia. He's a naturalized American citizen. Got so, it. And if you've ever if you've ever seen him or the photos, which I will be happy to dig up, it looks like a Saturday Night Live skit. So tied to the hotels, tied to these phony businesses, he was luring in big investors. But there were other scale of victims, too. Right? Yeah. Yeah, there were um, average people like you and me that were trying to get get ahead, try to save for their kids education, try to, you know, do a home renovation or something like that. And a lot of that is really lost in, in this story, right? You know, um, there were some very high end, very wealthy investors, but there were other people that were devastated by this individual. I mean, there are people who had serious psychological issues. These people have been through hell. Yeah. I mean, people lost their life savings. Um, you know, Carl Williamson is not innocent by any means. Um, and unfortunately, um, he killed himself. Tell me a little bit about so you couldn't arrest him that day in New York because you didn't really understand yet his role. How did that part of the case develop? So this is so Gignac's arrested sometime in November. Now we have a lot of evidence coming in. Terabytes of data, a lot of, a lot of hard evidence, um, fake DSS badges, license plates, sports memorabilia, paperwork documents, things like that. Fake fake diplomatic license plates. Correct. And then did you say fake badges? Yeah. His, his agents, his security detail were posing as DSS agents. That's, that's ironic. Yeah. The okay. badges were very good quality, too. The rest of the aftermath. So you were able to find overseas bank accounts. And how much money did you estimate he had swindled, Gignac had swindled? $8.2 million. And so there was no trace of that money, right? He, or, well, sure there was. We had to find it. What, what had he done with the money, I'll say? Uh, he spent it. He spent it. All the things you saw on Instagram... The lavish lifestyle, um, the cars, the hotels. I think his apartment was about twenty thousand dollars a month. He spent the majority of it, um, but again, some of the money was put in places that are not too friendly to the United States government. Some places that might be sanctuaries for illicit funds, and you know, people like that. We went looking for overseas accounts. Yes. How did you How did you work that out? So we were able to determine through electronic search warrants that he had bank accounts in foreign countries. And there was a specialist you worked with? It was a forensic accountant who was assigned to the Diplomatic Security Asset Forfeiture Division. And that helped a lot? Yeah, absolutely. And I knew we were, were dealing with a financial crimes case here. So um, I had paid for her to come down TDY and spend some time down there to work the case because we needed that expertise. And at this point, we're in probably January or February, and agents that were on this case are starting to rotate out. We have other missions. We have other assignments. People are getting ready to leave. And it was like, okay, um, if you want to continue with this and we want to put this guy away on these crimes, we're going to have to have the, the manpower to do it. So she stepped up a lot on that while I dealt with a lot of the other things and, um, you know, looking at these bank accounts and stuff like that. But long story short, we worked with Treasury. We were able to seize these accounts. We were able to get warrants on these accounts. And then um, very interesting, uh, just a few weeks ago, a few months ago, we were able to get 
about $600,000 returned to the United States from one of these sanctuary islands, uh, and that'll be given to the victims for restitution. So asset forfeiture is always talked about, but you know, this is a case that keeps paying dividends and we were dogged in getting that money back for these victims. So uh, it was returned in, uh, I think, June or July. And it was very interesting because the attorney general for this island, um, it's the Isle of Jersey in the English Channel, basically made a public statement and it was in the, in the BBC that, you know, hey, bad guys don't hide your money here. And I thought it was a nice kudos to, to the department, uh, that uh, foreign government official of that level. And in a place like that, that's known kind of like a Grand Cayman or whatever would, um, would turn that over and then make such a public statement. So at the end of the day, uh, what kind of convictions and what kind of time is Gignac looking at? So this is where the case got really interesting. Um, he took a plea, then he rejected the plea. Then he was trying to control the tempo of the court process. Um, but at the end, he uh, pled guilty to four charges, passport fraud, aggravated identity theft, wire fraud, and impersonation of a diplomat. And he was sentenced to 18 and a half years. That's a wild case, Ryan. I know you have other stories from your career, and we may see you yet again on the podcast here. But I want to thank you for your time today. That is, that is incredible. Great. Thank you.